Well, welcome to the College of Complexes. This is our 372nd meeting since we started in February 2009. We'll put a speaker on every week a different subject. We require our speaker to take a position on an issue or express a point of view. It had to be for or against something. We don't care what it is. We give an hour to make a we give up to an hour to make a presentation. If anybody interrupts the speaker, we remind you to interrupt them unless only one fool at a time. That's one of our rules. Then we have question and answers from the audience, not speeches. Then we have remarks, rebuttals, everybody in the audience at once who gets five minutes at the podium here to respond to what the speaker said for or against. Our speaker gets the last word, gets a comment, and the comment goes to me. That's how it works. But before we introduce our speaker, it's time for announcements. Anybody have any announcements they want to make? Now's the time to do it. Anyone have an announcement they want to make? Sure. You can skip your announcement tonight. Any other announcements? You got your dog sold? Yeah. Yeah, you're okay there. Any other announcements? All right. Well, next week is uh, J July 22nd. Katie Jawad, he's going to talk about has the U.S. Saudi relationship outlived its utility. That's on the itinerary here. I'm not going to read all this. Uh, you discuss and argue how to be spread the, the Saudi influence in the Middle East. Had to be, it just led to an emergence of, well, anyway, <coughs> it's on your itinerary. Read it. I'm not going to read all this. And on July 29th, uh, how families can suffer fewer losses as a result of heart disease. And Dr. Robert Edmondson, renowned physician, he'll be talking here. That should be interesting. And uh, on uh, August 5th, I mean, 375, we'll have uh, on white contributions to racial equality. So things are, he, he takes a position and it. it's on the itinerary. On September 2nd, uh, yes, Labor Day passed, President Future, uh, Gene Lance, President of Lance for Retired Americans, will be our speaker. I also, we also have a speaker for August 12th. Uh, I just got it today, so it'll be on the it'll be on the air in a minute when you read it. <clears throat> but our speaker tonight is uh, Jan Jan Lee, and she's the she's going to talk about unlocking the mysteries of Chinese characters. In she's a, <clears throat> she has a PhD in anthropology and. Mandarin, and it's a Mandarin teacher. She will unlock the mysteries of Chinese language. She argues that there's always more time, more than one way to see the world. Learning another language, especially a language that is totally different from your own native one, will help you to become a better and smarter and a better global citizen. So without further ado, please give a very, very warm welcome to Jian uh, Li. Yes, right here. If it works. Working? Yet. Um, you are, you are two. Yeah. 
uh, there's another one, I think. <laughs> so, uh, the topics, because I made it, I know <laughs> what each one is. So I'm going to cover all these topics, and our first topic is benefits of multilingualism. And then we'll talk about Chinese language and how unique it is. And then we'll talk about spoken and written Chinese and give you a couple of examples. And, we'll, and you can learn it too. And we'll give you a test about that. So benefits of multilingualism. Um, next slide. Um, language is a window to see the world. Um, in a lot of places, people know more than one language. When we uh, have two languages, it's called, what do you call a person who knows two languages? Bilingual, right? Three or more lingual languages, Trilingual. and then trilingual or multilingual. And if you only know one language, you call them American. <laughs> That's right. So there's a joke that says, like, if you only know one language, it's called American, or uh, uh, mono, monolingualism, right? American. Um, and then they always, uh, there's a, there's a, some people think, like, why should we learn another language? Everyone speaks in English. And I would argue that um, it's really not that difficult to do two languages or three, three languages. And by knowing more than one language, you have, you have opened another window to see the world. world. It also makes you smarter because the more languages you have, it's like math and um, playing piano, it increases the neural connectivity in your brain. So it actually makes you uh, smart, smarter, right? Of course, my students learn more than one language and prepare them to be more competitive in the global job market. And I teach in a, a private school, and Alcon school, um, it's an IB school, and a we, uh, in IB school, it is required that all students will learn a second language. And our school has made a decision. Our two languages that we teach is Spanish and Mandarin. And there's a shift now um, from job, uh, German, French, um, kind of European languages to Spanish and Mandarin. It is not unusual for schools to make a decision just to teach Spanish or Mandarin instead of French. Another reason that our school doesn't teach French is our school is very close to international school, which is a French school. The first language in international school is French. So they can always go go to that school. Um, so we um, in our IB school we have language A and language B. Language A is the native language. We teach English literature, English language and literature, and language B is Mandarin and Spanish. So that's English, Spanish, and Mandarin. Um, English being language A and Spanish and Mandarin being language B. Um, I want to give you two examples of uh, multi, uh, lingual, multilingualism or bilingualism. My daughter was born um, in uh, Illinois, and when she was born, I made the decision of speaking only Mandarin to her for the first two years before she could protest, right? So, um, so the first two, two years, I only spoke Mandarin to to her, and by the time she went to kindergarten, she, her Chinese was better than her English. But after a year, her English became better than Chinese. So to me, I was I, I was never um, afraid that her English would not be as good because her first language would be taught Chinese. Because in this environment, English would be much easier for, for her. And I know there was a debate like uh, for being bilingual, for people of Spanish background to um, focus on English and not to speak uh, Spanish, afraid that their English will not be as good. It's, in fact, children have 
natural abilities to know two or three more languages. Uh, it's not the ability, lacking of ability, it's lacking of opportunities to speak English properly. If they live in a ghetto where everyone's speaking Spanish but not English, so their English might be limited. It's not their abilities, it's more of their social environment. So I was pretty sure my daughter would be able to do English just as well, if not better. So in fact, when my daughter was like third grade or fourth grade, her English was much better than other kids. Her English was better than her math. Um, it's kind of like counterintuitive for some people. They always like think Asians are good in math, but may not be good in language. But my daughter has always been like really good with languages, and she started to write poems when she was third grade, fourth grade. But she sometimes struggles with math. So it's always a learned behavior. It's not genetically determined. And I also uh, uh, tutor a, a student from international school. Um, he, his father is French. His mother is from Mexico, Spanish. So he was brought up with French and um, Spanish and of course English in the environment. So he was trilingual, but his parents want him to learn Mandarin when he was first grade, six, seven years old. And he has been learning Mandarin with me for many years, and now he is like Spanish, French, Mandarin, English. And he is only um, 14, 15 years old. So that it's a learned behavior we can all learn if parents encourage and give opportunities for kids uh, to learn. So this um, is a language by numbers of native speakers. Um, which one has the most native speakers? Mandarin, Mandarin Chinese. And now you know why we need to learn Mandarin. Mandarin has so much more people than native speakers of English. The first one is Mandarin, and the second one is? Here, Spanish. Spanish, no. Spanish. Okay, Spanish. Um, and the third one is? No, look. English. Hindi, Hindi, Arabic. And English is way back. English is 5.43. Native speakers, native speakers, like you were born with. Even like in Europe, say if you were, you were uh, brought up in France, your native speak, speech is French, right? So the, the, the native speakers, of course, Americans and British and some other countries, but in terms of native speakers, their parents and people associated, they, they learn the first language. That's why it makes sense that we teach Mandarin and Spanish and not French and German anymore. Yes. Or, I mean, it's their schools who teach French and German, but there's a shift, especially now because uh, Chinese economy is um, developing so fast, number two and maybe number one. So there's more um, shift towards Mandarin and not talking about economic and the military possibilities just sheer number um, of people speaking, it makes sense that kids were Mandarin. It's a not easy language to learn, but it's learnable. Um, now, the third largest language actually is Hindi, but very few school teach uh, Hindi. You know why? It's a limited scope. No, there's a lot of people speak Hindi. It's number three. Uh, no, not number. Yeah, yeah, actually, more people speak Hindi than speak uh, Arabic. We do have Arabic speakers, yes? Because they have a second language of English. Yeah, they actually, uh, good point. Uh, they actually uh, have a first language, a second language is English. Hindi, in, in India, they have more than 17 official languages. In China, there's only one official language that's called Mandarin. So everyone in China, if they speak Cantonese, you speak Mandarin too. 
so there's only one official language. If you learn Mandarin, you can communicate with anyone from China. But if you study, you learn Hindi, you cannot communicate with, with someone from South or North, people who speak uh, another dialect. When they call dialects, they say like they have 14 or 17 official languages. So, so that's why English is like very popular as like uh, official business language. So if you speak English, you can go by at least do business in India. But in China, uh, although a lot of people study English, but Mandarin is the num number one, and you only need to study one in Mandarin language to communicate with Ch Chinese. Okay, so let's go to see. Um, I'm going to talk about both spoken and the writing. I'll focus more on written, but we'll start with spoken language. I just mentioned that um, the official spoken language in China is called Mandarin. And then there are a lot of regional dialects, like Shanghai dialect, like Cantonese dialect, and there are like at least um, 30, 40 dialects. And the dialects in, in Chinese language are so different that uh, someone who speaks uh, Mandarin in North, like Beijing, can't understand someone in Shanghai. It's like Chinese and Italian. The difference is so big that Chinese wouldn't be able to communicate in speech. But they can communicate in writing. The writing is not phonetic. It is kind of picture, logographic, or ideogram. ideogram. So they can communicate by writing, but they cannot communicate by speaking. The dialects are very different. Um, Chinese man, well, Mandarin in particular is monosyllabic. Uh, mono means one. So the characters, the Chinese words are very short <coughs> by itself. Like my name, Jian, Li, and usually one consonant, one vowel, Li. The, the shortest <coughs> Chinese, the shortest last names in the world are the Chinese names. Indians have one of the longest yes. last names. They are so long that they will say, call me uh, SJ, call me ABC, yeah. right? Because you can't come <laughs> call some, such a long name. But Chinese names are like Li, Wang, Zhang, right? Yeah. If no Chinese, like a lot of them are Li. So Li is like one vowel, one consonant. Wang, one consonant. So short, so it's called monosyllabic. Uh, um, the hardest part of spoken language is Chinese is tonal language. It has four tones. And if you don't say the tones right, even you say the consonant right, vowel right, you don't do the tone right, it's a totally different um, meaning. So that's the hardest part. Um, the Chinese characters are not like anything like this, but in order for um, what Chinese will say foreigners, non-Chinese. Nowadays, even Chinese students, <coughs> to learn proper Chinese, we use a system that's called pinyin system. Pinyin system, P-I-N-Y-I-N, pinyin system uses 26 English letters to spell the sound. Pinyin means to spell the sound out. But it's a crutch. It's not a real language. It's a crutch to know how to say the, these words. Mm -hmm. And there are two different uh, pinging system. One pinging system was made by British linguist, um, two British linguists, Wade Giles, um, and another is made by, uh, by the linguist from China, commissioned by the government. So sometimes, um, you will see the spellings of Chinese names, location names or people na names differently, past and current. Uh, for example, we say, uh, let's make an a easy example. Uh, you probably remember, uh, say, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, Beijing is called Peking. 
Guangdong, Guangzhou is called Canton. Uh, Peking, um, Canton instead of Beijing, and um, Guangzhou, um, one is Wei Jiao's, um, one is Pinyin. So the old way of like spelling was the old British way, and new way is the Pinyin. There are some similarities, but it's not totally the same. And after 1982, um, the Pinyin system was accepted by um, by the majority, by by the government, by the Library of Congress. So the newer way of saying we use the Pinyin system. If you know some Chinese history, you know um, Zhang Kai-shek, Mao Zedong, those names used to be spelled by Wei Jiao's, but now starting to use uh, Pinyin system. In Chinese writing, it doesn't change because it's not phonetic. But in, in Pinyin, in the phonetic system, you see the location names and uh, historical names can be spelled in two ways. And that's why they are different. And that's why we're seeing Mao Zedong spelled differently now than we did, say, 20 years ago. That's right, yeah. And the Zhang Kai-shek different. Yeah. Um, so the four tones in, in Chinese, uh, actually, there are five tones. The last tone is toneless. And I'll demonstrate the five tones. We start with ma. And second one is ma. And number three is ma. And number four is ma. And number four is ma. Oh. <laughs> and the first one, okay, the first one, okay, okay, now let's try, say after me. Ma. Before 
and it was hard to memorize the gender for everything. Paper has a gender, table has a gender, ta chair, yeah. and why do you say this is male and this is female? It's not yeah. like always lo logical. But they, so you have to memorize them. And they only have two, like either male or female. Is that neutral? Is it neutral too? No. Yeah. no. It has to be male and a female, right? So you have to memorize. With Chinese, every character, every sound has one of the four tones. One of the four tones that you have to, but most people, like, they have varying degrees of mastering four tones. Some are better, some are not so good, but in a sentence, usually people figure out what it probably means. So that's the, the speaking um, four tones. Let's look at the next page. Do um, they use a diphthong or, something, or accent ever? Um, it's a little bit different. Uh, the, because the, the Chinese words, every word has a tone. So the, the accents and the diphthongs are a little bit different than English. Because every word, word already has a quiet tone. Um, so I will focus more on written um, Chinese. So you see, the, this is the written Chinese Zhong, this character Zhong means middle. Uh, middle Zhong has two meanings. One is middle. Another is Chinese. Have you heard a name for China is Middle Kingdom? Yes. Middle Kingdom, and that's the middle. So what does Middle Kingdom mean? Middle Kingdom, at least one of the explanations is that Middle Kingdom is China consider Chinese people or emperors consider China as a center of the world. When you're in the middle of the world, you're the center of the world. So it's center. Um, and then this character means middle and the center. Then you see there's a box and there's a line goes across. So this character means two meanings. What are the two meanings of this character? Middle, middle and a Chinese. So one means uh, language. Zhongwen means Chinese language. Zhongwenzi, uh, Hanzi, these are means like for the Chinese, they don't use phonetic. They just memorize this character and they say it as Zhongwenzi, Han, Hanzi. Okay, let's go to the next one. Next page. Um, so Chinese characters, um, there are many different ways of describing Chinese characters. I uh, like just to use it just to say logogram. Logo is like a sign a picture, logograms, and there are different ways of making a Chinese character. Um, it is monosyllabic, we talk about one, one vowel, one consonant, basically. And a hanzi, anyone still remember what does hanzi mean? Hanzi, Chinese characters, okay, Zhongwen and hanzi. So hanzi means Chinese characters. It's used in Japanese as kanji. And a lot of Americans know more like kanji, but, uh, but kanji actually comes from Chinese, hanzi. Um, thousands of years ago, Japan didn't have a written language. So they borrowed Chinese characters as their written language. And later, um, about six, seven hundred years ago, they decided to reform their language because using Chinese characters as not quite compatible with their spoken language is difficult to each characters. So Japan now has a system of using kanji, hirakata, and katakana. And hirakata and katakana, they are phonetic, actually. Kanji is not phonetic. So their system is a mix of Chinese characters as logogram and the hirakata katakana that actually is phonetic. So kanji is hanzi, it's a Chinese character. And Korean used, used to use Chinese characters as hang, um, hanja. And now Korean has reformed its language to such an extent that they have gotten rid of 
Chinese characters. They have their uh, their current written language is phonetic. It's a different system from English, but it's phonetic. And it's easy to to learn. Um, and Vietnam used used to also use Chinese characters, and now has its own language. It's also phonetic. Um, only China still uses its logograms from 3,000 years ago. The other cultures, they kind of evolved. But Japan uh, still uses, like Japanese students have to know 1,000 Chinese characters. Chinese students have to know 5,000 characters. Um, and the Korean, they, uh, although they have designed another written language, but their history books used to be written totally in Chinese characters. So their high school and college, in order to read history, they need, need to read Chinese characters. Japanese too. The higher they are learn, learning, the more characters they need to know. Because if they don't, they cannot read their history. Um, Chinese characters are over um, 3,500 years old. At that time, there were no paper. So the, the characters were carved on bones, turtle bones, and that's what's called oracle bones. And in the beginning, it was uh, kind of simple lines, not fully developed, but they were carved on oracle bones. And sometimes people ask, like, how many Chinese characters you need to know? How many characters are there? But it's kind of a difficult question to, to answer just as if I ask you, how many English words do you know? Do you know how many English words are there in an uh, English dictionary? How many English words you know? Do you, do you have an answer? 20,000. I think there are around 3,000 or 4,000 English words. So we don't really know, but I have people ask me, like, how many characters I need to know? So I just checked, like, in a basic Chinese dictionary, there's 85,000 characters, okay? So in English, in a basic, in a good dictionary, there are probably that many words, too. We don't really know. And um, how many characters do you think I know? Uh, probably five to six thousand. We usually say like after college, you know, about five, six thousand. Um, to to be literate in Chinese, I give a big range, one thousand to to six thousand characters. One thousand uh, maybe can be something really simple, but anything more sophisticated, you probably need to know like five to six thousand characters. Okay. Um, how, how do dictionaries work? Do you have an alphabet? In these simple type languages, do they have an alphabetical system? You know, like the English dictionary is based on alphabet. Yeah. So, so when I talk about Chinese structure, um, I'll just simply address this question now. Basically, there are two ways of um, checking Chinese in a dictionary. One is by structure. Another is by sound. By structure is decoding the strokes one line at a time, and there are different basic structures of Chinese language, and we talk about structure. And the second way is by sound, like pinyin. Pinyin, we use uh, 26 letters, so like li, li, and you can type li, but there are a lot of homophones. There will be like 15 li, li with different tones and combinations, you have to recognize the lead that's useful to you at that moment. You have to uh, choose it, so by the structure and by sound. Um, most languages, actually, nowadays in the world, all the languages are phonetic, including Arabic, including Korean. It's phonetic. Phonetic means how you say it, you can basically start to write. Chinese is the only language that's not phonetic. And that puts challenge for uh, a phonetic native learner to learn Chinese language because it's totally different, it's not phonetic. It's like two languages. If you have to 
If you learn speaking and writing and reading, you, you have to learn two languages instead of one language. So that's a challenge for me to teach my students. My students have to pass the same level of examination for Spanish and for Chinese. So they have to work harder. If they don't, it will be hard for them to pass. It's, it's really hard, harder. Um, so logographic languages, if before we have Egyptian hieroglyphs, we have Maya, um, those languages used to be kind of like logographic, right? They were not phonetic, but they are dead. Only archaeologists study them. So Chinese is the only remaining one that still use non-phonetic logograph uh, characters. So remember this character, Zhong, Zhong. means middle or Chinese. Um, and then loyal, we have Zhong, the upper part is middle, and the second part, Xin means heart. So this has two parts. One part is the sound, and the second part is kind of meaning. Like if your heart is in the middle, in the right place, you are loyal. So this Zhong Xin, two characters, means loyalty. Um, and then the, these four characters, Dong Nan Xi Bei Zhong, means four, five directions. I put there because in English we usually say four directions, four directions, north, uh, east, west. Um, but in Chinese, uh, we say there are five directions because there's a middle, and China is in the middle, <laughs> right? It's a middle uh, uh, kingdom. So middle is very important. There are five directions, not four directions. So Zhong Guo, means middle kingdom. Zhong means middle, and Guo means country, uh, middle country. Zhong Wen, Wen means language, means Chinese language and Zhong Yi, Yi means medicine. So Middle Kingdom's uh, medicine is Chinese medicine. So Chinese hospitals, big hospitals, usually have two departments, Western medicine and Chinese medicine. So they will say Zhong, Zhong Yi and a Xi Yi, Western medicine and Chinese medicine. And you can make a choice, you visit Western medicine or Chinese medicine. So a lot of times, because to the Chinese, middle means Chinese. Anything related to, to middle, it means Chinese. Okay. Let's go to um, the power of the ideographic written language. Um, <coughs> Chinese um, language is such that it provides uh, unity, continuity, and identity for uh, Chinese people. A lot, lot of other cultures, when they go to uh, another place, another country, they take religion with them. Uh, but Chinese people, they go to another country, they don't take religion, they take Chinese language. So in, like in Dallas, in Plano, there are a lot of Chinese schools. There are not many Chinese Churches. They will go to uh, Christian church or Buddhist church, but not Confucianism or any Taoism. Like they don't do Confucianism, Taoism, but they do Chinese language. And and this is same as like uh, in Malaysia, in Singapore, um, people who went to um, some other Asian countries with a long. Uh, history of Chinese immigrants. Third generation or fourth generation, they still speak Chinese and they write Chinese and they allow of Chinese schools. And because the written language is not phonetic, that also provides a stability, continuity. Like English is a phonetic language. So today, the way that we speak English is very different from Shakespeare time, right? Um, it's very difficult for students to, to read, understand, and act uh, Shakespeare play because the language 
changes because our speaking changes. But Chinese, because of local graphic, is not connected with how it sounds. So it's easier for Chinese students, Chinese, to read history 500, 1,000 years ago, even if they speak differently, but they just writing is still the same. And, and in terms of unity, like the speaking language dialects can be so much different, but in terms of writing, it's always the same. So it provides unity and continuity. Sometimes there's a saying that Chinese culture is the only continuous like civilization, unbroken civilization in the world. It's not accurate. There are a lot of revolutions and there are a lot of uh, breakdown of cultures. The only thing that kind of provides continuity actually is the language. Um, not everything else about culture is a language. Um, the, I put a question mark for cognition and order and stability. There are people who argue that the way that Chinese language um, is structured will affect the way people think, the, peop the values that they ha have. That's kind of controversial. And, and it could be, but it doesn't have to be because the cultures change, language stays same, but it doesn't mean that people are conditioned by language such that they don't think outside of the box, especially if you know two or three languages, it's just one way of thinking. So I put a question mark. Okay, so um, now I'll give you some uh, examples of the ways that the characters are made. Now, the first, um, the easiest way of thinking of our characters is pictogram, like a picture. For example, this character, uh, it means the sun. It used to be more like a round, and now it's kind of like um, this shape. This is a, the sun, and this is the moon, okay? So it used to be more like a half moon, and not everything you can set as a picture, the sun and the moon. <laughs> okay. Um, and there are words that concepts, only the nouns, right? Only the na nouns, you can have a picture. But if it's an idea, you cannot make it as a picture. So like here is the second way is ideograph. Ideograph means idea picture, idea picture. For example, up and a down. So this is up. So if you look at the solid line down below, solid line, and this is a line above, so this means up. And then you have a solid line, and you have another line here. This means up and down. And then actually 82% words are called um, pictophonetic. It, part of the words have Meaning, another part has a sound. So these two words have something in common. Can you see that these two words have three dots? Three dots, three dots, okay? So the three dots on the left side, the three dots in grammar term is called the radicals or roots. So this three dots roots means water. And this character means river, and this means lake. And there are many words with three dots, a root, the Chinese way of root, roots. Once, once you see three roots, three dots, it means something related to water. Uh, so this is river, and this is um, a lake. And you have to, to have at least 300 characters in order to see the roots. Um, and the meaning and the sound. So the, the, this part tells you it's water. The other part tells you how to make the sound because they are in other root form, they are other words. And then there are logical aggregates. Um, for example, this one, remember we have, what's the 
what's these two? Sun, sun, sun and, and a moon. And this word is combination of sun and moon. Sun and a moon. It means right. Right? Right. <coughs> Sky. Right just means right. Oh, what? And right. Right. Oh, right. 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 Wrong. Not right. No, no. Right. 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 This means you have sun and moon together. It's very bright. But <coughs> by extension, it also means tomorrow. And they say, oh, Chinese are very optimis optimistic. Tomorrow is a bright day. It's tomorrow and a bright day. And this character has two parts. One part means wood, W-O-O-D, wood. And you have two wood together, which means forest. Okay? And then this word, you have three words together. It means like huge forest. <laughs> So that's an aggregates. So if you combine these, it's already 90% something, but it's not 100%. So there are other less uh, used grammatical ways to make words, but these are the major um, ways of making words. Okay. Um, now, um, this is a picture of examples of how the characters have made changes, evolutionary changes over 3,000 years. On the left, on the left is the original. So do you still remember this one? The sun. So look on the extreme left, does it more look like a sun, yeah. right? Okay, so over the years it just changes um, and now it becomes like this. And this one, do you remember? Yes. Moon, it's moon, and the looking on the left, it looked more like moon, and then over the years it changed. And this one means mountain, and if you look at the mountain on the left, it used to be more like a picture. And this one means water, and if you look at left, it's kind of more water. Of course, this one also looks like water, right? Doesn't this look water? A lot of dots in the beginning. This one means rhyme, rhyme. And this we talked about is a wood. One, one, one piece is a wood. Two pieces together is a forest. And this one is a plant. It's less easy, not as easy to see. And this is a person, like a person standing. So on the left is the original word of person. And then by now, this character is a person. See how it changes throughout history, but you still can see the connection a little bit, okay? So these are pictograms, and these are all nouns, so it's easy to have picture. But then there are concepts that you cannot use pictures like this, okay? So let's see the other example, this next page. So this character, um, the first one um, is, this is to, oh, this goes this way, okay. So this way is horse. So in the beginning, on top, is more, a little bit like, more like a picture of horses. And this one is a cart. Cart, that you see the wheels, but by the end, the wheels kind of come down. Fish, fish, fish. The most interesting one is dust. How can you do dust? But there are a lot of lines, dust, 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 until this one. And this one is the to see, to see eyes. So you can see the eyes to see, and then change. And by the end now, it changes like this to see. So these are some examples of throughout history characters change. Okay. So um, English has 26 letters. Chinese have different strokes. And there are only 12 basic strokes. Once you master 12 strokes, there are just different ways of rearranging these strokes. So if you look at 12 uh, strokes, it's not that 
complicated. Uh, from here to here, and these are examples of using these strokes. But you do have to have patience to put the strokes together into characters, okay? So, uh, let's see the next one, next page. Okay, so there's a character, wing. So how do you, you cannot picture like to wing. It's not like uh, a hint, right? It's a concept, wing. So it's a story about how to win. How does win look like in Chinese? It's very interesting. I'm going to explain. So this is a whole one character of win. It has five components, actually five characters. So this is a character by itself. This is another one. This is a one, two, three, four, five. And each one has a meaning, OK? So the first part on top, it means to lose and to perish. Uh, some of you might, heard, heard, might, might have heard the uh, uh, opportunity in Chinese as um, danger and opportunity, danger and opportunity. So you have to have a concept of urgency. Yeah, concept of urgency. If you don't have a concept of urgency, you don't act, you cannot win. So that's one concept actually at the top is to lose and perish. And this is a mouse, like you open your mouth, mouse, this call, it means mouse. You need to be able to communicate. And this, do you remember this? Moon, okay? Moon by extension is time. Like it takes time to do things. And this character, Bei, means money. Like used to be, uh, money was like seashells, shells, uh, treasure, um, money. And this one means fun, means commonplace, ordinary. Um, you have to be uh, calm and be an ordinary uh, state for a long time to be patient to achieve. So in order to win, you have to have the concept of urgency. If you don't act, you might lose and perish. You have to be able to communicate. It takes time, it takes money, and it takes patience, and just to be hum humble at the same time. So all these five components together, it means to win in Chinese. And then, um, because as I said, Chinese are monosyllabic. It's very short. So if win and lose, there are two characters. Um, this is a character that's a pinyin, shu yin, shu yin means win and lose. Um, shuang yin, shuang yin means win win, both parties. Feng yin means win win, multiple parties. We just add one more concept. Um, Chinese texts, in order to express an idea, Chinese uses shorter words than English to express an idea. They say like the United Nations have five languages. Um, Chinese being one, English, French, Ger German, um, what else? The, the five languages, Chinese um, translation is the smallest one. Because Chinese actually uses less words to express ideas. Okay, let's see next page. So now I'm going to teach you and, and then we'll have a test and see how much you can remember. Okay, the first one, so we have Chinese characters, we have a pinyin and we have English. Okay, so I think most of you know how to say hello in Chinese. Ni hao, ni hao, ni hao. So here is a pinyin ni hao. Now pay attention to character too. By the end, I'm going to withdraw the pinyin, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is a character, ni hao, means hello. And the second one you want to know is how to say thank you. Thank you is xie xie, xie xie. Now, this pinyin is not very intuitive. X, why does X sounds like xie, xie? Because there's no equivalent. They just choose X to say xie xie. Okay, try xie xie. It means thank you. And China, Middle Kingdom, is Zhong Guo. Zhong Guo. Zhong means middle. Guo means country. 
Okay, so Zhongguo, Middle, Middle Kingdom, Zhongguo, China. And America is Mei Guo. Guo is a country. Mei means beautiful, beautiful country. China is very nice to, to the US. Give you a very <laughs> nice name, means beautiful country. Mei Guo. Guo means uh, country, and Mei means beautiful, beautiful country. Um, Ying, we talk about Ying, what does Ying mean? Yeah. To win, okay, Ying means win. Gong Ying means win win. Now next three characters are really easy. E, A, San, one, two, three, you see? This is the idea. One is one line, right? E is one line. E, this is one, number one. Number two, two lines. A, two lines. San, Three lines. E R set. And now once you go four and five and six, there are no lines like this. There's other characters. So E R San, can you remember? One, two, three? Okay. Now I'll give you one minute to go through these and then we're going to withdraw one site and I have you to check your memory. Okay, now let's look at the next page. Okay, the same order. Yeah, same order. So, ni hao, what does it mean? Hello. Hello. Xie xie. Thank you. Thank you. China. 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 United States. United States. Gong, uh, actually, I should say ying and then gong ying. Ying. Win. Win. Gong ying means win win. E, one, e, A, sun, one, two, three, right? See? Good job. You know most of them, right? Okay. Now, now next page, we have pinyin, no character. And I'll say Chinese and you say English. Ni hao. Hello. Xie xie. Thank you. China. China, middle kingdom. Mei guo. America, Ying, Win, Gong Ying, Win Win, E, One, R, Two, Sun, Three. Good job. I got most of them, right? Okay. Now next, we are going to have Chinese characters. <laughs> Same order. Test your memory. Okay. Ni hao. Xie xie. Thank you. You can learn Chinese too, right? It's not too hard. You have how many words you know now? Look at these, how many words you know? Three, four, five, eight, eight, three. So, what's the last one I wrote? Xie Xie. Thank you. Thank you. So, you pronounce it like S S H? Yeah. S H R I or just S H H H? Xie Xie. So, the X I E is like S H and an E. Right. So, the way Jiao's will be written more like what you think it should be. But pinyin was not written by English speakers, but by Chinese. So, xie xie, xie xie. You did a good job. You know some Chinese now. <laughs> OK, so that's all for my presentation. I'm ready to take questions. Yes. It seems, uh, oh, well, I'll wait for him to get this going. You got to open it up. John, it seems that uh, China has a preconceived take on things in the very language. What if it's a more complex um, thing going on where it doesn't exactly match the way you say it? Because the way you say it contains a take on what it is, and maybe it's not quite that. Try to explain it another way. Idioms. Okay, well, 
Um, the United States is a beautiful country. Um, what about when we do something that is not beautiful? This is actually, now there are two different parts to it. One part to it is sound, another is a meaning, okay? So actually, uh, China, uh, Middle Kingdom, uh, um, yeah, it's kind of meaning is Middle Kingdom. And that actually reflects, I was going to talk about, it's like what anthropologists call ethnocentrism, ethnocentrism. A um, lot of cultures, including Americans and Chinese and French, always think we are the best, right? So that's what Chinese think, we are in the middle of the world, we are the best. And that's like 3,000 years ago, or 2,000 years ago, or 1,000 years ago. But Americans, like there's a concept of American exceptionalism. What does American exceptionalism mean? Because we are the best, right? And French probably think we are the best in French language is the most beautiful. So that's anthropologically, we have a concept we call ethnocentrism. Um, a lot of cultures, and even Japanese and smaller countries, they think they are the best. It's kind of universal, it's not particularly Chinese. But in terms of like America, a beautiful country, it's more of a sound. And usually Chinese try to give a nice name to every country. America, the, the, the reason that America gets made for is because the second sound of America is America. So we didn't take A, we take Meh, and so the Meh sounds like May in Chinese, sounds like beautiful. But May as a homophone, it could be other words like no nothing. Like they could give a name like no nothing country, <laughs> all beautiful country. But that was like given many, many years ago, I don't know, hundreds of thousand years ago, they decided to choose a nice name, beautiful country. But most but, people but they think could in say terms of sound, not really meaning. So they could say it tongue in cheek and uh, have it have another meaning. If, uh, if two people, one speaking Japanese and the other Chinese, were talking to one another, would they be able to understand no. a certain amount? Nothing. Basically not, nothing. Even like a Chinese from Canton, from Shanghai to Beijing, they can understand mm -hmm. if they were speaking regional dialects, let alone Japan. But in writing, when, when if Japanese come to China and they don't know Chinese language, they can write kanji and Chinese will understand. But kanji is not 100% match, but it's like 70, 80% match. So that in writing, they can communicate. What is that called? Speaking. The Canton? Cantonese? Kanji. Kanji. Kanji is a Japanese word for Chinese character. What is the earliest age that uh, you think it would be feasible for a child to learn Chinese as a second language, say like an American? As, as early as possible, like I taught my daughter, exposed to my daughter Chinese when she was born. I made a conscious decision, no English but Chinese. So the sooner the better. But of course most, like in, in my school, Alcon school, now we have started to teach Chinese first grade, but we started to teach Spanish even in kindergarten. Well, I was thinking kindergarten, I, I've, heard, I've heard it said, and I wonder if this is an accurate statement, that in addition to that natural, whatever it is, brain structure that kids have that uh, makes, it, makes it easier for them to learn a language at an older, at a younger age, and they lose it, we all lose it around middle teens, because more difficult. You, when you approach an oriental language, when you use these little symbols, you tell them it's a secret code, and that kind of, does that motivate, do you use that method? Is that a reasonable pedagogical tool to help motivate the kids to say, oh, this is a secret code like the decoder ring we used to get from Captain Midnight, I don't know who <laughs> Captain Midnight was, but you know, that was just a, a cultural icon. But uh, that would seem to, does that appeal to younger children? It depends on, on kids, it depends on students. Some students want to take challenge and they feel proud, they know a very difficult language. 
and some kids, some students just give up and they don't want to learn a difficult language. It depends on the individual. But most American students don't start to learn Chinese until middle school. Which is the law. When most of us were coming up, or at least when I was, we didn't do foreign languages till the ninth grade. Yeah. That was about eight to ten years too late. And I don't know where those ideas come from, but you know. But you can always learn. My student, my friend, Chris, how old were you starting to learn Chinese? I was 52. 52, <laughs> really? <Yeah. laughs> and uh, he, he, uh, he started to learn Chinese when he was 52, and he now can speak basic, well, we're, fairly we're, we're, good we're, we're, Chinese. Why? He's 52. Why? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. As usual, I have lots of I'll frame my statement in the form of a question. How did I meet Jen Lee? <laughs> well, let me first start by discussing computer chips. The most, does anyone know the name of us? at least one computer chip company? Intel. Microsoft. Intel. 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 Texas Instruments. Texas. Samsung. Do you know the most valuable computer chip company in the world. In the entire world, it's a Taiwanese computer chip company that was started by a genius from Texas Instruments. No, it's called Taiwan Semiconductor. And I have worked for Taiwan Semiconductor for 20 years. And after 15 years and maybe 75 trips to Taiwan, I could speak exactly nothing in Mandarin. And the reason why is that when we speak with our teachers, and you you can correct me if you would, but when I say, you say, what does ni hao mean? She says, ni hao. But that's not at all what it means. Ni hao means you good. So now we literally know what ni hao means. It just happens in Taiwan and China when you say hello to someone, you say, you good, you good, ni hao, ni hao. And then if you if you say ni hao ma, have you heard that? When you ask a Chinese teacher, what does ni hao ma mean? It says, it means, uh, how are you? It's not what it means. It means, you good, question mark. Ni hao is you good. Ni hao ma is you good, question mark. Jian li, ni hao ma. Han hao. Han hao. Han means very good. So if they were to teach us the literal meaning of ni hao. No, I, I don't teach, te te teach the visual decoding until you're paid students like you. That's right. right. That, that's <laughs> right. That's, so, so the decoding comes out that way. Well, so how did I meet Jen Lee? Is uh, after 15 years, none of us, Mei Warren, Americans, could learn Mandarin at all. And I used to sit in this Korean coffee shop, and Jen Lee would be in there teaching Chinese to a, you know, a, a man. I don't want to waste the time. That is oh, you know, ridiculous. Nobody ever learns Mandarin until I learned Ni Hao, you good. And then slowly, after four years, weekly, Wolf Wei Shuo Yi and Chong. And it's because of her. Thank you. Jim. Yes. Now, actually, the lesson here is the opening of the mind that I can speak it. Before he met me, he thought it's impossible. He was working with a Taiwanese company, but he thought the language is so difficult. It was like not possible. And then he started to open his mind and he thought, oh, it's possible, I can learn. And once you, you, you start to think you can learn, then, then you really start to learn. But Chris still has a blinder about reading Chinese characters. He says, I can read, I don't want to read. So he, he doesn't learn reading, but once you make a decision, you say, I can read. See, you can well, read, well, then you the can reason. read. It has a dual meaning, right? Well, the reason that, um, I, the reason not to learn both at the same time is it's like learning Russian and Swahili at the same time. You just, it's too difficult. And so if you focus on just the, the, the speaking and the listening, then later the writing I have some friends at my Taiwanese company that can speak Mandarin and, uh, and listen to Mandarin, but they can't write it. So, but at any rate, maybe I'll make a go of it. I didn't know about that 12-stroke business. Is that all there is? 12 strokes? 
By the way, my good Chinese friends, they have very disciplined minds. And by the way, the strong success of the computer chip company that I work for is that we only make computer chips. We do not design computer chips. The designs come from very innovative, in many cases, Americans. So the Americans have these ideas, and the Mandarin-speaking Taiwanese can execute the ideas. So we're talking about bringing cultures together. The most valuable computer chip company in the world is Western innovation and, 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 and Eastern execution. And that's made the most valuable computer chip company in the world. We overtook Intel only two months ago in total value. Uh, we, we talked. You, you talked about letters. Uh, what about numbers? Has the China, have the Chinese people always used uh, Arabic numerals or a, something that is very similar, or did they use something further in the past and switch to Arabic numerals the last couple thousand years? Um, actually, there are three sets of numbers Chinese use. There's like I showed you. ER sign one, two, three, those numbers, like these are Chinese characters. But there's another set that's more complex in banknotes. So in banknotes, they want to use the most complicated Chinese characters. So it's harder to, uh, to kind of fix, right? So like Arabic numbers or these ER signs is too easy. Okay, so for, for big numbers, they have another set. But for doing uh, mathematics, you, we use Arabic num numbers. And I gave a talk a um, few months ago, Finding Zero. How many of you were here when I talked Finding Zero? And when I talk about Finding Zero, uh, the, the numbers that we use, so we call Arabic numbers, most likely it started in India. But that's not that crucial. The, the European numbers used to be the Roman letters, like old clock. You have 10 as in X, D, X, B, I, right? B, uh, five or six, depending on where you put I. And those numbers, if we use X, B, I, those numbers, it will be very difficult for us to do high level mathematics, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to 10 times 100, and you use those numbers, x, 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 v, uh, right? So this is same as like Chinese. If Chinese are using the Chinese characters to do math, it will be very cumbersome. It's not, not possible, but it's cumbersome and take more time. So we use what we call Arabic numbers. But Arabic numbers, most likely either from Arabic or from India, and not, neither from China nor from the Western. Cultures. Do you know roughly when Arabic numerals were introduced to, to China? Was it like within the last 100 or 200 years? Or was no, no, long, long time ago. And we, I, I think at least, at least will be six, seven hundred years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 What is the history of Mandarin as far as how many thousands of years uh, does it go back, the use of Mandarin? What do you talk about writing or speaking? Speaking. Speaking. Speaking, um, the standard Mandarin, actually the word ma Mandarin is from, um, is the last dynasty of China is called Qing Dynasty. And Qing Dynasty, they are, they are Manchus. So the majority of ethnic Chinese are called Han Chinese, H-A-N, Han. Han Chinese, and Chinese characters are called Han Zi. But, but Chinese history used to be dominated by dynasties. And some dynasties are ethnic Chinese, some Dynasties, the emperors are non ethnic Chinese. I say non ethnic Chinese. So, the, for example, uh, Mongolians, Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan, 
conquered many parts of the world and conquered China. And under his rule, Chinese dynasty was called Yuan Dynasty. Um, so Mongolian language is one of the major languages in China, but not official. So come to Man Mandarin, Man Manchuria. You probably heard Manchuria. Mm -hmm. Manchuria was kind of like three northeast provinces of China. And Chinese don't call it Manchuria, call it northeast provinces of China. Whereas Mandarin and Manchuria, the origin was the Manchu dynasty. And Manchus are not ethnic Chinese, not ethnic Han Chinese. They were barbarians from north, according to Chinese history. Okay, They were barbarians from north, wanted to invade and grab Chinese, but they were chinese -ified. like we say Americanized, but they were chinese -ified in such a way that they became emperors of China, and eventually their language in the north became Mandarin. And Qing Dynasty was from 1644 to 1911. After 1911, China becomes a republic. Before 1911, it's dynasty. And the last dynasty from 1644 to 1911 is the Qing Dynasty. So strictly speaking, Mandarin is the last is the legacy of the last dynasty. And the second part of this question is how many thousands of years of recorded history does China have? How far do you have a continuous record of history? You mean the back? written language? Not necessarily the written language, of the written history, of any history of But of the China. history has two parts. One is oral history, one okay. is a written history. When we talk about civilization, we usually we usually start with written language, okay? Um, and it's a kind of bias, historical bias. But the written language of the uh, oldest Chinese text is about three thousand years old. Okay, Confucius, Confucius writing. Confucius was born about five um, uh, five hundred BC. And uh, uh, Confucius' family genealogy started like 2,500 years ago, and that's the written records. And his Confucius genealogy is the longest genealogy in the whole world because it's written and still continuing today. Yes, let's, um, let's take the example of a, a noun, a dog, and in the written language, Say you want to modify it. Say you want to have three adjectives like big, black, angry, dog. Is that then four separate symbols? Or do you modify the symbol for dog in some way? You, you don't modify the word dog. You, you put, uh, put different adjectives, big, uh, angry, dog. So, so it will be like three or four characters. And then um, the other question is, uh, you explained that uh, the sun symbol started off looking quite like a sun, now it looks like a square. Um, so when you, is that, um, and, and are they sort of intermixed? I mean, or, or did, did the language move in sync? So it doesn't get jumbled up, in other words, you don't have a, like a, um, a bright, well, a bright, well, you know, the, the bright symbol being the earliest symbol that hasn't been changed or has changed, but, but then gets mixed up with the sun, which is the latest symbol. So is there some confusion, though, in, in the language? Or, I mean, so you, because you have about, what, it looks like five or six generations of the written language. Right. Um, there's no confusion, because uh, each time, uh, historical time, they teach only one form of the written language. Um, unless you're a historian or scholar, you have a need to know the evolution of the words. But if you're not a scholar, you will be just given one set of current symbols to teach. Oh, so basically, write. then, if you're a scholar, you have to sort of learn about five or six different versions right, of the language. Right, that, that's a Chinese linguist job. Oh. And 
I show you just to, to, to have fun, but most Chinese students, they don't, they don't really know. But then um, there, right now, in terms of written Chinese, there are two variations. There's a simplified Chinese and traditional Chinese. In China, mainland China, um, they use simplified ch Chinese. So some complex words, they will make like simplified strokes. Instead of 20 strokes, they make it like 10 strokes. So it's easy for students to learn. Whereas in Taiwan and Hong Kong, they want to keep the tradition. They don't want to make changes. So they use more historical, older Chinese version. So is it true that the, the main reason why this um, written language evolved like that was because it, um, it was more difficult to write the, the older style, and so to speed things up, they, they changed it? Is that, is that the main reason? Yeah. Pro probably to make also make it more standardized. Um, used to be handwriting, used to be calligraphy, and then as we want to spread literacy, we went to more standardization and printing. So just a, a process of standardization and a simplification. So, but in, in terms of writing it, um, is it is it as a Say I want, wanted to write a sentence in English and then in, in Chinese um, or Mandarin, um, would it take about the same time, or, or you have to have a have, do you have to have a writing very skillful writing technique? Because if you write too fast, it's not like people writing in English. Some of their writing is it totally illegible? <laughs> is that true? Well, if Chinese is first language, they are used to, and when they write fast they will write another style that's not like standardized. That they, instead of separate strokes for this wing, they will make, make it kind of like what we have, uh, print versus, what's the other way? Like cursive. Cursive. So when you write cursive, you write a little bit faster. So Chinese has its own way of cursive that they can write it faster. Can they write it faster? Yeah. Okay. In fact, they type Chinese characters faster than they type English. Mm. It's all by practice. It's yeah. all similar. Actually, like the languages in the world, I sometimes wonder uh, which language is really harder to, to learn. It, it, it depends. Depends on your first language. If your first language is Phonetic, it's harder to learn non phonetic language. But if for Chinese, to learn Chinese language without reference of phonetic, it's not difficult. That's all they know, that's all they practice. So that's the way things are. They never complain, it's difficult. Uh, so sometimes I wonder the true test will be someone from Mars who don't know English, who don't know Chinese, and have them to, to, to learn and see which one is difficult. But for us, we already have preconceived notions. Like I asked my daughter, uh, is English, uh, Spanish harder or Chinese harder? Because she learned Spanish and Ch Chinese, right? So to her, she says the same. She says Chinese is no harder than Spanish. You know why? Because I told you, I exposed her to Chinese before she could talk. <laughs> so in a way, like she was unconsciously absorbed. And then uh, she stopped learning Chinese when she was a teenager. She just refused to learn. And then when she went to middle school, their school, she could choose Chinese or Spanish. But you know, teenagers, they rebel. They just don't want to listen to their parents. Like, if you want her to learn Chinese, she says, no, I want to learn Spanish. So in middle school, high school, she learned Spanish in school. Learned five years, four or five years Spanish. And then when she went to college, she chose Chinese again. After first semester, then she chose Chinese again. So she learned Spanish and Chinese. And now I ask her which one is harder or easier. She says same to her. 
But if I ask American students who, who were not exposed to Chinese, they would think Chinese is much harder. So presumably, a Chinese has a, a separate grammar too that you have to learn. In grammar, actually, Chinese is pretty much like English. Like our basic grammar is subject, verb, object, right? Um, I read a book, I eat dinner. So it's subject, verb, and Chinese is like that. And grammar, in terms of grammar, Chinese grammar is much simpler, right? Chinese grammar actually is more simple. Um, in Japanese, it's um, subject, uh, object, and a verb. Verb comes after object. It's different. But Chinese actually grammar is very simple. Which of the languages of uh, Chinese, Spanish, or English colors your actual perception more. For instance, as an example, in English we talk about breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There's the presumption that it's a three meal day. Is what what are the other languages like in that regard? Most languages have three meals like that. It's hard to say. Like if I have learned a concept First in Chinese, then I was thinking Chinese. But then, if I learned a concept first in English, then I think in English. Um, it depends on which concept I have learned first. That so my my thinking goes with whichever language who that I acquired first. I know when uh, I've had a chance to uh, uh, videotape Henry Kissinger speaking. Uh, you can almost watch him thinking in Hebrew or in Israeli or German or something, and then he's translating into English. Uh, so the thinking is going on in that language. But I think the ultimate challenge is, what language do you dream in? Uh, it depends on the scenery. If I, if I, if I'm talking here, I think about what I talk, then I'll be in English. If I think about things happened in China when I was a child, maybe I'll think that way. It all depends on what happened, when, when, which language came. So to me, I'm like, I feel I'm totally bilingual. I'm, I can do a code switch very easily. In fact, I've lived, I talked, I read more English than Chinese. So, in a way, English comes more easily to me now. Um, following up on John's comments about grammar, do you know what diagramming sentences is in English? No. Okay, scratch that. Uh, do you, is Dr. Sun Yat Sen a root? Uh, Sun Yat Sun? Yeah. Sun, 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 Sun Yat Sen, and now we say Shun Zhong Sun. So, Sun, Sun Yat Sun. It's so highly religious. Yeah. He's, yes. a very, he's a very he's a, he's a religious? No. No. He's highly regarded though, is it? Yeah. He, he is highly regarded. He is highly regarded. <laughs> he is. He he is highly regarded both in mainland China and Taiwan. Because he is uh, basically first president of uh, China after the fall of Qing Dynasty. Did he lead the revolution that that uh, called that ended up in the change from the dynasty to the republic right. form. Yeah, he helped to uh, to the birth of Republic of China. Does the name General uh, uh, Claire Lee Chenault mean anything to you? Say the name again. Claire Lee Chenault, General. He, he is what? Uh, uh, flying Tigers. Yeah, I know the Flying Tigers. He was the leader of the Flying Tigers. So do, do the do the uh, Chinese people? Remember the Flying Tigers, the American Expeditionary Group, in, in good terms or bad terms, or we don't talk about it? Well, if people know about Flying Tigers, of course it's good in good terms, because that's, that's the help uh, Americans um, give to the Chinese people in fighting the Japanese, right? The Second yeah. World yes. War. 
So of course that's good terms, but not everyone knows the history as much, but in that particular case it has to be positive. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I can jump some more questions. <laughs> The Uyghur, the Uyghur people in Western China, yeah. are they native Chinese speakers or is that their They are ethnic Chinese. That's, yeah. that's what we call like a, they are officially they are 56 ethnic Chinese, 56 ethnicities in China. Han Chinese is like 92% and uh, there's 88% are non-Han Chinese, and the Uyghur, and the Mongolians, and Tibetans, and the Koreans, and um, there are 55 ethnic Chinese plus Han Chinese, 56. What, is there a definition or requirement to be an ethnic Chinese, or is it the language? Most or? ethnic Chinese is like language and culture, except Except there is one interesting ethnic Chinese, it's called a Hui Chinese, which is based on Muslim Islam. M Muslims, uh, um, they are one of the ethnic Chinese, and they are kind of religiously different, but Christians are not ethnic Chinese, but Muslims are ethnic Chinese. And partly because they are kind of like from Ar Ar Arab, Arabic traders who went to China, and they stayed in China, so they can also look different, but they are, uh, they are mostly based on religion. And right now, Chinese government is worried about revival of Muslim in China too. And they wear their, their scarf and they pray five times and they became like, uh, yeah. The, yeah, like, uh, yeah that's one of the ethnicities. So Uyghur is one of the ethnicities. Can you, is it possible to look at these one of these 55 different ethnicities and tell them apart visually? Or? Some you can, some you can't. Because intermarriage, because of time goes on. It's, oh. it's like Americans, like some after intermarriages, you can tell your ethnicities totally, but if they are isolated, they are kind of pure Uyghur or pure Tibetans, you can still tell, but if they intermarriage after few generations, it's hard to tell. Um, I'd like to have a sense of what it's like when you're teaching, um, like, how, do you teach one class of 40 people or two classes of 30, and then do they come twice a week? No, each or school is different. Week, or and then, um, and also, are they, are many of them, um, you know, Asian American or, or things like that, where they already know the language some, so they have a heads up, kind of? Uh, yeah, and, my, my and are people doing it for business reasons, or are they doing it for personal reasons, or no, they just my, it? it's very difficult to say, because, like, like my school is a private school, very oh. expensive private school. So, kids... We start to teach now first grade, so there's no business or anything for little kids. It's just for fun. So in our school, we started to teach first grade half, like one semester Spanish, one semester Mandarin. Everyone will be exposed to two languages until third grade. Then they make a decision. The kids make decision of discuss with their parents. So by fourth grade, they kind of choose a track. And by seventh grade, they can choose another track. track. And by high school, uh, some, like if we get students from other schools who, are, who have never learned a second language, that will be a big challenge because they have to learn that language. And some kids have already learned five or six, and then I got students like zero when they are here, ninth grade. So I have to, to teach from, I have to give separate tutoring to bring them to, to speak. So ours is a private school. We have very few students. The higher, the fewer students. For 11th and 12th grade, I only have one student. But public schools, like if you have one student to learn Mandarin, they will cancel the class. Our private school, we don't cancel. Even if you won, we put 100% for this one student. 
What is the name of the school and about where is it located? Just curious. Oh, Alcon, A L C U I. It used to call some Alcon School. Al Alcon, Alcon. It's on Churchill and 635. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. Alcon School. And Alcon School um, start with Montessori and then IB, NYP Middle School, IB. And then we just added high school diploma program, DP. And once we are DP program, like we start 11, 12, the DP program is very challenging. The papers are designed in Europe mostly and will be sealed envelope mailed to IB schools and students and teachers don't know anything about what the test is about until that moment to open the envelope and one of the things like my 12th grade will do is open the envelope and start to hand write a 400 character article essay. And it's the same like if you are Spanish, you do like 400 words in Spanish and for Chinese, they will have her to do 400 Chinese characters. It's tough, but as it is. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? <laughs> Last question. What time is it? Uh, is it possible to learn the characters and have a minimal focus on the spoken part? Yeah, it's a choice. You don't have to learn spoken at all. You can just learn Really, as, as you have a choice to learn just speaking without writing, or you can do uh, reading without speaking. It's do, all possible. Do you have dialogue tapes? You know what dialogue tapes are. You can you can borrow from libraries now. Public libraries have all um, dialogue tapes of all languages. Oh, that's my phobia for foreign language. This is just dialogue tapes. We have to sit down. Okay. Well, now it's your turn to talk, so who wants to be first? Come on up here. Comment on what the speaker is saying. I don't like being first, but I'm all. Huh? I, I have a lot of controversy. Uh, oh, yeah, this one. Okay. Uh, is there a key? There's obviously a community in Dallas that is promoting Chinese language. Mm -hmm. Are there other linguistic communities like Hebrew, uh, Japanese, French, Spanish, German that are promoting their languages? Yeah, there's French, there's a very well-known uh, lingua francaise. Um, funded by the government. Right? Some, and, and Craig, we yeah, do, yeah. do so, have a format here, and this is your time to comment, not to yeah. ask questions. Uh, 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 but Ch Chinese lang language is, is like, uh, <coughs> as I said, there are more Chinese language schools than any other languages. But there are Polish language, Turkish language, French, German, every ethnic has their own uh, language school, not as many well, as Chinese. Community too. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. It, it seems like to me that uh, I mean, American the below college education system has many flaws and shortcomings that have increased over the last 30, 40 years. I wonder if we would be better off if, if the local public school districts would be receptive if people who want to promote another language would approach them about supplying the teachers and the materials for those students that were interested. Well, it's not a question anyway. Sorry. <coughs> Any questions? Yeah. 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 Commented on this before with regard to musical study, and uh, I think that language applies in the same way. I don't see a lot of young people here, and uh, of course we may all feel young, but 
when you engage in an exercise like the learning of a language at whatever age, you are creating new patterns in your brain. And I think you will discover if you engage in something like this, that it helps across the board and that it increases your skills, your mental skills in many other areas. And so uh, I think uh, I would give my high recommendation if someone here wishes to launch into the study. And I certainly thank John for coming here and presenting. Well, Jen mentioned that one of the more difficult things for English speakers to grasp hold of is the tone. You know, that is to say, we, we, you know, we did the whole exercise of ma, 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 a bit like that. And English speakers, we only think of the sound. We have no place in our brain for the direction. So that was the, a huge challenge to carry the sound and the direction. Any engineers in the room here or mathematicians? There's a mathematical concept called a vector. It's a number that has two variables. And so I think of the Chinese words as a vector. It has a sound and, and, a, uh, and a direction. So, so I'll say just something. And, and I actually, my Chinese co-workers always make fun of the way my face moves when I spit out what little I can say. But I say, And so I have to carry the direction. Did I get it right? Kind of? Sort of? By the way, some of my Chinese colleagues that come up to me, they say, your, your, uh, your accent is kind of weird. <laughs> Thanks. But anyway, I'm, as I mentioned briefly before, that I'm one of the few native English speakers that can speak a little bit of Mandarin. And what an enormous outpouring of attention I get by being only able to say a few things in Mandarin well. Whereas so many of my other English speakers can't do anything, and they all give up. And it's to the joke that we started with, you know, what's a, if you can only say one thing, is it there? But I would say that when we first started in this thought about making new brain patterns, learning how to count e, r, san, si, wu, jiu, yu, yu, qi, qi, ba, jiu. Sure. Um, I felt like just even learning those ten little sounds was like turning up dirt on, on a very hard platform of dirt. It was just like, oh, it, like this is so preposterous to learn to speak even these ten sounds and the direction. But after a while of turning up the dirt, my brain became more fertile, and actually, it, I would call it new neural networks and. Uh, Maybe I'll come back sometime and talk to you all about neural networks. And that's a new form of computing that's coming to the world that's patterned after the way our brains work. And our children have 10 trillion neural networks that are unprogrammed. And my grandson, I have four grandkids, I can see their neural networks are, are learning English in this case. And, they're, and so all my Chinese friends, it's just it's natural that they, they learn that way. And so I speak a little bit of Mandarin, what little I know, even after four years to my grandson. But anyway, that's it. Well, thank you, Jan. That was very interesting, actually, and entertaining. Um, it's sort of a um, was highlighted some of the uh, the problems of uh, of learning an, any language. And I, uh, as you can tell, I, I came from Europe, and of course now the EU has 27 um, members of the EU, and there are 27 languages. Now that presents a problem, even for the expert language. Now I never was a very good. In fact, uh, my worst subject at O levels. O levels is what you take when you're 16. And the worst subject was French. I, I got not sort of allowed to pass in French. 
Uh, Latin, which I took, I did somewhat better, much, much to the surprise of my Latin master, because I, my regular score in Latin was something like five out of 20 and six out of 20, and that's, that was my general level of performance in the weekly tests, which were a nightmare. Anyway, but so uh, the um, so what do you do when you, when you are someone like me who um, doesn't have a good linguistic memory, unlike my wife, who is fantastic in the younger days. And so what you really do when you travel about Europe is you take a phrase book. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and of course, when, you, uh, when I was uh, about 22, we drew, I went with two Greeks, and we drove from London all the way to Greece and all the way back again. So, you know, we went through uh, about five or six different countries. And so, now in Greece, of course, it's a Cyrillic alphabet, so you can't even read it. It's just looking like Russian, or even pronounce it. So, you, uh, you sort of go, go by the seat of your pants, so to speak. But uh, what you tend to do is to get the phrase book out and learn the numbers, you know, which are pretty good. And then something like Quanta Costa, which means how much is that? Mm -hmm. uh, the directions. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> you learn a few words like steak and uh, fish and chips and other such delicacies. And you sort of get by. But the, uh, but the real problem is, is if you pretend to know more than you do, then the native person says, oh, and it battles off in, in their native um, mm -hmm. language. And it, it's, of course, you. It's impossible you can't, you don't understand. So it really, really, when you travel, it's best to say, je ne sais pas, you know, je parle un très petit français, la langue française est magnifique, but I don't, je ne parle pas de français. Anyway, something like that. So they forgive you, generally, if you try a little bit. And of course, the, in the old days, French used to be very snooty about, about speaking French, and so, but, we found out that um, if you try a little bit in any language with a phrase book, um, it gets you by, and that's what gets me by. But you know, there are so many, I don't know how many languages there are in the world, like several hundreds. You know, yeah. Uh, you, yeah. <coughs> some of them both get, but some are so obscure you'll never, if you're up the Amazon, maybe. But, uh, it's a really, it's, it, it really is a, a, a troubling um, thing, and I always admire people who could speak. In, in Europe, you find people who speak you know, five, six, seven languages, and especially in countries like Switzerland, which of course has three sort of native languages uh, right there, for example. Of course, we have Scotland, where if you go there, you won't understand it. <laughs> it's all. And in fact, funny, um, when a Scottish girl was interviewed uh, in Rochester, New York, she was said, well, what language do they speak in Scotland? <laughs> So naturally, she said, Ah, hi, Scottish, of course. Anyway. I guess I'm the last one standing. I want to thank our speaker for being here today. It was really great. <laughs> she did a terrific job. Taught us all how to begin to think about Chinese. I know I took uh, Latin in high school, and uh, it, it was a was a, it's a dead language, but it, it correlates to other languages. I don't think it correlates to Chinese, but uh, correlates to a lot of the Germanic and uh, Latin languages. So I took that. I took German. I, I learned that in somewhat. I forgot most of it, but uh, anyway, it's good to know these things. It's going to be able to communicate with the rest of the world. If we go back in our history, I guess it goes back to Adam and Eve, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the yeah. old Tower of Babel. Before that, uh, you know, we all spoke one language. And in this country alone, uh, there's dialects, you know, of English. Uh, I can remember when, uh, uh, talking about dialects, there was a, when, when, uh, when Lyndon Johnson was running for president, there was a woman in East Texas that was on the radio and I heard it in Chicago, and she says, at last we got a president that ain't got no accent. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, language is a uh, uh, dialect is where you're not from. And I presume that language in the long run, the, uh, over the total, uh, the total spectrum, diverted from where, where you're not from and that's how languages were born. But it's good to know more languages. It makes you think 
communicate with other people in the world. And I, like John said, he, he learned his phrase book, and I did the same thing in Greece and other places. And people were very happy if you knew a few words. Ah, you speak a few words, they're very happy, you know. If you didn't speak their language at all, they were very unhappy. So they ignored you, you know. <laughs> it's, it's how it was. Anyway, thank you so much for being here today. We, we really enjoyed it. I have a question for, for you. The, uh, the Chinese ha has a standard language called Mandarin. So my Chinese colleague asked me, um, is there standard English in America? TV English. And um, I said, I don't know. And we asked our colleagues, like teachers, and uh, they say we don't have a standard English. They say, like, one of our colleagues was from, she is from Texas. So she speaks with a little bit Texan um, tan. And uh, she says, that's fine, like, people can understand me, and I just teach the way it is. And we were kind of surprised that there's no standard English we teach our kids. So, question, do you think there's a standard English that we should teach our kids? No. No. I, I kind of think that there is because we still have the grammar uh, but that's rules. not yeah. rules of grammar, so that if you're teaching it, you're teaching yeah. present, past, future. You're yeah. teaching the past. But in terms of spoken standard, not yeah. the writing grammar rules, right. like tax, Texas English is different from New York English. Right. It's different from Ohio, right? And yeah. then people, like in Britain, people are very aware of the class uh, background. If you don't speak a standard English, people have negative views about you. You're from a poor family, right? If you speak like each neighborhood in Britain is, ha has its own uh, special way of speaking, and people judge you by the way you speak. In America, although people don't really judge you by the way you speak, but I think people still do. If you speak with really Texan yes. or black English, mm -hmm. but not like standard good English, yeah. many people in their heart they judge you. Wow. Yes. Right. Wow. So, so should we teach our kids like good standard English yes. so they will be not be judged negatively? Yes. It could yes. be done. Yes. Yes. I think. Yes. I think no, because New Yorkers think that Texans are stupid because of their accent. And here in Texas, we know they're a Meshuggah. Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, I think what would be a better book, well, English has what's called access. They're not really like dialects, because you can understand each other. But if we would, I think a fair criticism that people from the educated North have, who were also in the educated South, is that they have a bigger vocab word vocabulary that we do that shows up time and time again on text. So I think if you, there are books around, a man named Johnson O'Connor put out a little series of books and where you can teach kids more words, expand their vocabulary. That I think would be something that would achieve your goal of having your kids not judged and thought higher of, and as uh, and then the grammar thing is not to use uh, uh, I be gone or I have gone. But that's a separate question. Yeah. So grammar and vocabulary is separate. Uh, even a, like someone with Texas accent can learn just as good grammar or vocabularies as someone from New York. Yeah. It's how much how many things you read. How it's separate. I'm just talking about the speaking, the accent. I think the accent speaking in this country is more or less, uh, it's less 
there's less distinction than there used to be, because mostly because of television and, and because of news reporters, etc. That, that they have a, they, they hire them from the Midwest, so they have a language that fits with the whole country, and they, as a result, uh, even little kids growing up, they don't have the Texas accent like they used to. You can't say it. You can't see it. So that, leave, that leaves us with one compelling question. How do you say howdy, y'all, in Chinese, Mandarin? <laughs> <laughs> You're a good person. <laughs> this is our, they say ni howdy. Ni <laughs> howdy. Ni <laughs> howdy. So they picked up on some of our... Yeah, that's, that's uh, actually a joke. That's, a, but that's okay. absolutely and a joke. That's a it's, it's a recognition that you're from But, Texas. like, I would think it's better to have our kids to be able to to say like let's say not a second totally second language but in terms of speaking English one standard English like yeah. TV and a radio English right. like as good as TV and a yeah. radio yeah. standard yeah. and yeah. then your family background so like you can have one like as standard as a TV and a radio and then one as your family background in New York or Texas That's because right. if you can do this switching of codes, like Obama can. Obama can speak black English and can speak standard English, depending on the occasion he is in. Mm -hmm. And that helps him in moving up the social ladder. Yes. So I would think like our kids need to be able to speak best English they can, regardless of grammar. Grammar and vocabulary is separate, like it depends on they need a different system, but they, they, we should encourage teachers to speak standard King's English, not probably King's English, but people actually do judge how well you speak. And one is the confidence, another is the accent. So poor black kids, they speak a kind of language people might look down upon them, but if they speak really good English, then people will not look down on them. Right. It's not a good thing that we do have the prejudice, but you cannot deny that people have prejudice. So like to us, like we train Chinese and we know that it's a standard Mandarin, like if teachers in China, they have to be teachers, good teachers, they have to tr be trained in Mandarin Chinese. The best schools have best like teachers who speak the best Mandarin. But whereas here, teachers are not required to have the best English. Yeah. It, it, it may be grammar, they, they do, but they don't pay attention to, like, you have to um, speak in such a way that your students can. So that's, that's what, I, what I think will I happen. Mean, in English, we have an atrocious problem with spelling and grammar coming from official magazines and government offices. Is there a similar problem in China? Yeah, I, I think now there's unfortunately like the internet and uh, social media, all these things kind of dumbed down. Yeah. Dumb, dumb down the younger generation. Like you, you use very short phrases, you don't use good grammar, and you just can communicate quickly. So I don't know, in terms of like communication, it works, like people understand and people think it's funny and if, if language is just used for communication, it's okay because people understand, people enjoy that language. But in terms of, in terms of serious logical thinking, high level of conceptual thinking, I think there's a dumbing down trend, whether in China or in the United States. And I worry a little bit in the sense that that could increase the, the social class. That we have really, really smart people who design a code and who make a code so easy for ordinary people who don't need to know any code and who can use iPhone and to do a bunch of things. But eventually, 
those very easy things that most people can do will be replaced by artificial intelligence. Right. What so would you. leave those people who don't have high level of conceptual thinking and the creativity, they will not have jobs. Yeah. They will be very poor. Whereas we have very, very high level of creative, smart people who control ways of thinking and control the capital. So if our society doesn't have a way of foresee, foreseeing the potential problem and solve the problem that could create social <coughs> divide and a social imbalance well, and social the, unrest. Yeah, part of the problem with that is the teachers are what I would call dumbasses because they, they, they can't even write notes for their kids. Not every teacher, not me. Not every teacher, <laughs> not every teacher, but there's an awful lot of them. And when these kids come out of school, they can't spell words. They can't pronounce them. Well, the thing. problem is our society. Okay. <coughs> so as a teacher, I say there, if a student will achieve or not, it depends on three, three um, elements. It's the student, the parent, and the teacher. The three, if if the if, if the three elements, parents, student, teacher, if two of these elements work. The student will learn. If the two elements don't work, if I am a very good teacher, but students don't want to learn, a parent doesn't care. No matter how good I am, this student will not work. But if a student really is good and parents pay attention, even if you don't have a good teacher, student can always learn. So you have three elements have to work. Two of them have to work. So you cannot complain just about teacher. No, okay? right, right. So, so parents, right, right. if parents don't care, and a student don't care, no matter how good teachers, it won't work. I have a fourth for you, and that is social expectation. The expectation of the culture of their peers. That is where a lot of the problem with education is now. If they had a culture of expectation of learning at a higher level, then that would influence the children, even if some of those other legs of the table are not there. Yeah. So the Asian students nowadays, like the stereotype of Asian students, who usually do really well in all kind of schools, public or private school. It's not because Asian students are smarter. We are all similar by nature. This is the learning process. So Asian parents expect their children to do well. The expectation from parents push them. But the third generation, fourth generation, whether Chinese or um, other ethnic groups, they, they will be just like anyone else. So the expectation really makes a, a difference. And when we, we sometimes complain about a lot of things, but really we have to look into ourselves what I can do to make a difference. You cannot change other people, you can only change yourself. So if you're a parent, if you, you have children, you have grandchildren, you are responsible to help them to want to learn, right? You cannot change other teachers. So so my realization is like, I try not to complain, I try to be an agent of change and to encourage others to be agent.